Hi, everybody. Welcome to Rewriting Hollywood Summit. Uh, this is a really exciting event. Uh, I'm your host today, Jared Milrad. I'll be moderating today's panel discussions. Uh, we really have a, a, a lots of treats for you today. And welcome also to our podcast listeners on Rewriting Hollywood. Um, this summit is our first ever summit to, to bring together all of our social impact leaders uh, from around the country uh, and around the world, really, that are making a difference through the power of storytelling. Uh, and it's named after our award-winning podcast that spotlights underrepresented talent and social impact projects all over the globe. Uh, today will be an interactive virtual space. So for those listening live, feel free to ask any questions that you have, and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, for all of our panelists. Uh, we're looking forward to lots of engaging panel discussions with working industry professionals and leaders. We have a uh, live pitch competition uh, later on for some folks with some original creative ideas. And we'll also hear from a few Oscar nominated filmmakers. Um, but today for our first panel, really excited to have two incredible guests um, that I think you'll learn a lot from today. It's our industry panel featuring industry leaders. First up is Bree Frank, who most recently served as SVP of physical production at Hello Sunshine. Welcome, Bree. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And um, of course, Hello Sunshine was founded by Oscar winning actor producer Reese Witherspoon. We also have with us today um, Kiana Madani, who is an actor producer, has done lots of incredible work in the social impact space. Uh, also has been heavily involved with organization Movie Karma and appears in an upcoming um, Apple TV Plus series. Welcome, Kiana. Thank you, Jared. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. Um, and I'll try to illuminate both of your backgrounds for our guests today as we go. Bree, why don't we start with you? Um, you're a longtime advocate for people of color in media. You're an accomplished TV executive. Um, you have 20 plus years of professional production experience under your belt. I know you've produced over, I think, 300 hours of unscripted television, which is incredible, um, including shows in MTV, TLC, um, and, and lots of others. Um, and you took a leap of faith. We were just talking about it not too long ago, moving to LA and kind of building your career out here. Um, so if you would just tell us a little bit more, Brie, about yourself and your journey and kind of how did you how did you end up in this in this wild uh, industry we call Hollywood? Uh, I, I think I've always wanted to know, I always knew that I wanted to be in Hollywood in some version of it. I think that it has uh, morphed over the years. Sometimes I thought I wanted to be in front of the camera. And then when I understood what producing meant and learned that I could do stuff behind the camera, it it led to this road. I also need to say that I kind of fumbled my way through Hollywood, making lots of mistakes, not having anyone to look to in my family or in my friend circle that wanted to enter this crazy business. And so um, I think I found myself figuring out what I was good at and then being in places that um, could help me do the work that I felt like I was really good at. And um, it eventually led me to Hello Sunshine, where I was there to build out the physical production capabilities for the company, where I spent four years all together um, as a now senior vice president of physical production for Inscripted and also being able to tap into one feature film, which was on Amazon called Something from Tiffany's. Um, and so uh, what led me here is probably my addiction to storytelling and being a part of it. And what keeps me here is like the same thing and uh, the want to be able to disrupt Hollywood so that more storytelling uh, can be additive to some of the things that I've just seen over the last 40 plus years. Right, yeah, and lots of work to do there. And you've, you've been a real leader on that. So I'm excited to, for folks to hear about your thoughts there. Um, Kiana, uh, and thank you for that. Kiana, wanna hear your story a little bit and, and um, share that with our, with our guests today. You're an award-winning Iranian-American actress. You're a producer. You've been acting, acting, modeling, performing for over a decade, originally from San Jose, California. Um, I know you appeared in a number of projects, uh, including the, the political drama, The Pirates of Somalia, um, opposite, opposite Al Pacino, Evan Peters, Barkhad Abdi, and Melanie Griffith on Netflix, and done lots of other really socially impactful projects. Um, tell us a little bit, Kiana, about your journey and, you know, what inspired you to go into to acting? And I know as you're building out your career, I, I see you as a, you know, rising producer as well. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, like Bree, I always knew that I wanted to be in the industry in some way, shape or form. I started modeling when I was 16 and I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to do more than modeling. I wanted to be more creative and I've 
you know, grew up doing plays, singing, acting, but like Brie, I didn't have anyone to look to because I am Iranian American and generally we, in our culture, it's very rare to pursue a career in the arts. It's mostly like, okay, you can do that on the side while like studying to be a doctor, lawyer, professor, whatever. Um, I was so fortunate in that like my parents were very, very supportive. So I went, took some acting classes in San Francisco and I just knew at 16, I'm like, I'm gonna move to LA, I'm gonna make this happen. I might not know anybody, but I have to try. So my parents said, okay, as soon as you've saved up some money, so it took me about four or five years just working odd jobs, trying to <laughs> save some money. And um, my parents like, okay, well you have six months and if you don't book a job in six months, you're coming back. <laughs> and then you think about, wow, it takes so long to kind of get your feet wet and get going in uh, Hollywood. But luckily I had met my manager, my first manager, through an acting and modeling convention and so I had one person here that I knew and I booked a commercial as soon as I got here and since then it had, I got really fortunate in that regor regard and I've just kind of kept going and as I got older I realized how much more I wanted to do as well and I wanted to become I wanted to produce and write and create more for people like me who maybe aren't as don't get as much representation and then I realized that I can't wait for this to happen. I have to start doing it on my own. So that's what inspired me over the last five years. Like, oh, I can produce. And there is a space for female women of color producers. And we're going to make this happen. So that's that's where I'm at now. Um, it's yeah. been a wild ride for sure. <laughs> you know, we've done a bunch of projects together. You know how wild it is. Me yeah, too. it is truly wild. And I think for folks listening, I mean, I a lot of you, can, I'm sure, can relate to that sort of roller coaster that a lot of a lot of folks are on, including, you know, particularly those of us who are underrepresented in some way, right? Whether you're LGBTQ plus or whether you're color, or whether you come from, as you said, Canada, underrepresented cultural background or ethnic background. Bree, I want to go to you. Um, I'm curious, like, because you're someone I think who does bring a lot of strength to this industry and a lot of a lot of unique perspective are there folks that have really helped guide you or you know mentors tools or resources that have helped to support you to get you where you are today yeah I don't think that you can do anything alone I don't think that I ever really had an official mentor until I came to Hello Sunshine Liz Jenkins who's the CEO of the company is someone who I look to as a mentor and she's been a real champion um, for me, and I realized that until I um, met her, that I never had like a consistent advocate in my life. I have lots of people who are rooting for me. I've had some uh, amazing people who have made like micro deposits and who champion me, but I've never had the consistency of like being able to make a phone call and be like, am I thinking about this right? Um, until I met Liz, which was something that I often like still think about, like how far would, would I have been able to go if I had someone like her, like in my corner um, for the last 25 years. I love that. And that's, and I guess a follow to that Brie is, and which I'll ask Kiana as well is for folks listening to this, you might say like, I don't have a mentor either, or, you know, I don't know where to find one. Like, how do I get that support and guidance? Like, do you have thoughts on on how folks can build out community in that way? Yeah, I don't know if you want to go. I have uh, thoughts on it only because I feel like I mentor, I don't know, now like 21,000 people in right. my, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about my nonprofit yeah. organization. Yeah. Um, I think that you kind of have to, I think that sometimes people look too far up for yeah. a mentor and sometimes the person that you need that can actually advocate you for the steps that you need to make is much probably closer, maybe like one level above you. So it's really nice to reach for that North Star of being able to get someone in the C-suite because you they can be your sponsor and not just your mentor. They can um, advocate you for you inside spaces. But the one, the people who you really need to align yourself sometimes are your peers and people who are just like just a little bit above you so they because they're closer to the steps. I think that even with me, it almost feels like, like I'm so far that if someone who's like a coordinator is like, what's my next step? I'm like, uh, I, I know like on a cursory level, like who to call, but I'm now so far removed from the people that I was like in the trenches with when I first started. 
Yeah, that's a really good point of looking at your peers. Tiana, I wonder if you could add to that of just in terms of mentors or resources or tools you've had and you started out. And also, as you went along to Bree's point, how did you kind of keep building out community? How are you building out community? Sure. I think for actors who are just starting out, I think getting in a class where try different classes where other actors are working and are better than you. That's that for me was so important. I needed to feel like I was not the best in the class, not, you know, I needed to feel that fire underneath me. It was definitely, I mean, Jared, it took us a few years to find each other. And I think you have championed me more than anyone else I know besides my husband. And I think that being around other actors that are doing the things you want to do is probably the best place to start. And I agree with Bree, like not looking so high up, but like just, you know, say you're an actor just starting out with no credits, maybe you go to a class and you you meet people that have like two or three co-star credits, like things that are attainable and you can kind of um, pick their brains and see how they started. It really depends on where you're at and it is so hard to find the right community, but I think the first place you got to start is a class. I love that. I like learning, like not being afraid to dive in and then learn whatever, whatever part of the industry you're in. Um, I was going to ask you both, I'll go back to you, Brie, in terms of, considering opportunities when we were just talking about this before we we recorded here of, of where to spend your time time is limited we sort of start to realize that more maybe as we get a little older um but i want to give you space on that point Brie, to talk about your incredible organization who you know what it is why it's important to you and why it's something that you feel like is, is a place where you want to spend your time and your energy uh, well, Hue is something that is, it's like my passion project. Sometimes I, I, every time I talk about it, I get really like verklempt because, um, I can't believe that I built like this community from 27 people to now, to, I think we just hit 21,000. Um, and, uh, it's important, I think, because there's so much to learn about being in this industry and there's so many walls and barriers of entry and so much gatekeeping that I think that, being able to put people in the position to get transparency and to learn the lexicon of this um, industry is like really important because I think that if you don't speak the language that you'll always be seen as an outsider. So being able to provide like mentorship programs and mixers and panels and like have conversations with industry leaders about how they can change the way that they are operating to invite people into a space and actually keep them safe is really um, important to me. And so I'll continue to do it um, because it's so important to me. And I also feel like um, when you are from a marginalized community, however many boxes you check, um, your protest has to be personal to you. Not everyone can march in the streets. And so for me, he was my protest, right? In the same way that for Keanu, your art is probably your protest. It's like the way of showing up and saying like, I'm here. And so um, for as long as I have breath in my body, I, I feel like I will, this will always be my version of protest and I'll always be proud of it because of the changes we've been able to make in Hollywood. Yeah, amen. And I think just showing up in that way is so, it's such an important thing. And like you said, it is a form of protest and, and activism, absolutely. Um, Kiana, I would love for you to build on that in terms of where you've decided to spend your time. I, we've had many conversations over the years about this, and I know things that are happening in Iran are deeply personal and important to you. Projects that affect that part of the world are deeply personal and important to you. Could you talk a little about that and, and just sort of where you've evolved in terms of, okay, these are the kinds of projects I want to take on? Yeah, I'm actually in the process, I think, just building on creating your own work, feeling empowered to do that. Find the stories that matter to you and try and see if you can get the rights. That's what I'm focusing on right now. I found a story about um, Iran that's like ha tackles so many different topics because it's a country with so much rich history. And I feel really called to tell a story from a different perspective than what we've seen and what I see as an actor. I'm, I mean, some of the stuff that I audition for and that I see talk about wanting to spend your time I'm like I'm not spending my time on this at all this only furthers the narrative that you know Middle Easterns are other or dangerous or this or that so I'm currently working towards getting the rights on this book that I found that I feel speaks to me speaks to my heritage and my country and also I love a good period piece <laughs> that's where I really want to spend my time is 
I love history and I want to tell those stories. So this particular piece jumps from 1970 to the present day and there's so much to unpack too with the protests and demonstrations that are happening now, the female-led revolution that's going on over there. Yeah, I, 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 it's so so cool. And I think we'll inspire folks listening to this in terms of looking for stories that speak to you. Um, or, or in your case, Brie, looking to start initiatives, organizations that that speak to you and what you're what you're passionate about. Um, Brie, I want to go back to you. I mean, I'm, I'm curious as you look ahead in your own career, what other factors do you consider as you think about your next opportunities? Um, you talked about, you know, protests through your work, but I'm curious, like, for folks listening to this too, I think it might be interesting for them to hear, you know, as you move on in your career, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're, those decisions stop, right? Like, you're still trying to stay true to yourself. Yeah, I think that for a long time, uh, I had to take the work that would take me, right? Like, you don't really have in the beginning, I feel like it was really hard um, to just make choices about the things that resonated with me. And that's where I will show up. Mostly, if you don't have money uh, falling off a tree in your backyard, um, I looked at it as an opportunity to build a skill set. And so I wasn't, and I was, I think that I had to change my mind frame so that I didn't feel like I was being used. I often say like, sometimes you're either doing what you love or you're doing what you need to do to get by. And when you're, um, if you're lucky, you're able to do it uh, at the same time. And that um, you can figure out whether or not a job that you're taking is like a GoFundMe to pay your rent or to fund your dream bucket, or you can, um, you know, stand your ground and only do things that are meaningful, meaningful to you. I think that I've spent, I have enough sweat equity in this industry to be very um, decisive in what it is that I will do and what I won't do. And I want to go in places and be in places where I feel celebrated and not tolerated. I want to be able to be a part of the magic of the making and the hear the process. And I want to, um, I want it to be clear that I belong there and that I that I'm worthy of being invested in. Like I know my worth and I know my value, but I'm only interested in being where um it's very clear that it is also seen as well. And so I think that like for me, I'm about to venture into going fully into scripted. And so I'm kind of like taking a pause to get still. Um, and also just like pouring back into my bank because I've been working since I was 14. And so I I feel like I've worked so much to just take whatever came my way with the exception of Hello Sunshine, which is like a very deliberate thing. And I'm also taking a deliberate pause to figure out what my next steps look like for Brie. And that value comes from me and not how everyone else sees the, the value of it. Yeah, it's such a critical point um, of, uh, we were talking about earlier too, just yeah, taking that pause and taking that space to decide what you truly want to do and where what spaces you truly want to be in. Kiana, I know you've taken those pauses and time, you know, time to reflect as well. Um, so I wonder if you could just build on that in terms of what factors do you think about as you look at these different projects that might come your way or things that you want to pursue? And and what are your thoughts on, you know, taking that time to reflect and really, you know, think about where you want to be? Well, I think it's so um, important because in our industry, it's so hurry up and wait. And then you also feel like if I don't do this now, I'm never going to succeed. Or if I don't jump on this now, like, oh my gosh, you know, and I see like a, with a lot of my female friends, they feel like if I, um, you know, they feel this stress about turning 30, 35, having a family, like what I'm going to be, I'm going to be invisible after that. And I think, no, that's not true. And I hope that that's changing. I see some change, you know, with the Oscars this year, seeing so many people over the age of 50 winning Oscars. Um, so yes, you can take the time and really decide like, is this project right for me? Is this, does this align with my values as opposed to just seeing, just saying yes, because you want to be tolerated, not celebrated. And that's, that has to shift. And I, I think a lot of women, especially, we really struggle with that uh, in society, not just in our industry, in every industry where you feel like, okay, the talks, the clock is ticking. I have to do this now, but no, you have to do what aligns with you and don't be afraid to be like okay I need time to think about this I need does this align with my morals and my values and I, that was a lesson I really had to learn because in the beginning of my acting career I really struggled with that I, I really struggled with my confidence I really struggled with asking for permission taking up space 
And I think it's important for actors to remember that they can take up space. They can take, you know, it's not, you can be celebrated, not tolerated. I'm going to take that with me. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> That's a t-shirt. Um, I want to ask you both, you, you both, I, as you, I think both know I was raised by a single mom, um, you know, lots of respect for single parents, but parents of all, all kinds, um, you both are moms. Um, and so I'm curious if you, if either you want to comment or both you want to comment on just building on that as you do consider what kind of projects and opportunities you take on, you know, also balancing family and wanting to, you know, leave a legacy for the next generation, especially for folks who are marginalized, including your own, you know, your own kids in a way, like, you, just curious if, if either you want to comment on that and just, you know, balancing your values with your family needs and, and all those different questions that we all, I think a lot of us wrestle with financial family. Um, Brie, I don't know if you have your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, my oldest daughter is six and I think that I've, macro or micro I've gotten it right more times than I've gotten it wrong but I've certainly gotten it wrong and I think that like as a mom of two daughters um I have to, it, it took a while for me to realize that they were watching what they saw and not just what I was saying and so for me to tell them to pour into themselves to take a break to hold the line to have boundaries but then I'd be working like 16 hour days consistently with no break and not giving them um, the time that I was dedicating to my work, yeah. right? Because I say, I'm doing it for them. I'm working this hard for them. Yeah. I'm doing this. And like, and really what I'm showing them is that I, you know, what I was showing them in the past is that I knew how to prioritize work, but I didn't know how to prioritize them. Yeah. And that when you're parenting, you're always trying to figure out like what's going to stick to the wall, right? And in your mind, you think, oh, here are all the things they're going to walk away with. But what they're walking away with is how you see yourself as a woman. And you are you effectively become like their version of like Google, right? When they look up love, they're going to reflect on you. When they think about hard work or boundaries, the first resource they're going to go to is you. And so if you're not walking it and talking it, then you have two people that you have accolades that the industry like loves, but you have two people who feel like, like, where, like, where were you? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so I think that I've worked really hard to carve out time to be like, this is family time and this is a priority. And I pour more into work when I'm able to pour into them. And so um, it's taken a lot of mistakes um, and it's taken a lot of hard work and tears, quite frankly, to realize how important it is to to create those boundaries and separations. But um, and I'm always like a work in progress and I'm always trying. I'm not going to always get it right, but I am committed to trying. Yeah, and that's and that's such an important part of it, isn't it? I mean, I remember, you know, my mom's own struggles, you know, to your point. I mean, you remember the absences. Right. And it's like but it's also like. Yeah, because she was working because she was, you know, because she was trying to make ends meet to support us. So it's sort of like, how do you, your points are so, so well taken of how do you strike that balance? Kiana, I know you've wrestled with this too, of being home with, with your daughter, and then also like balancing decisions about jobs and travel. And could, could you talk a little bit about wrestling with oh some of them? Oh my God. Well, the mom guilt is so real. The first time I went away on a uh, business trip to film away from Sierra, like it was a week and I, I felt so bad, but then I, I really thought about it and I thought about how I grew up. My mom was always working and I really admired that about her. She had her life outside of us. She was working full time. She had her friends that she would go and see. And I always knew in my heart, like I wanted that for my kid whenever I had one. And it's only gonna make her stronger and it's better for both of us. And it ended up being a really beautiful thing because when I got back the connection that we had and I, I want her to see that she can do whatever she wants in her life and I she she will have no restrictions she can dream it and go for it and and like you say Brie like they see what you do not what you say so um I, that was really really important to me to see her for her to see her mom chasing her passions and learning that she could do that too but it is a balance so yes I try to like very much carve out specific time where it's just me and Sierra doing things. There's no cell phone, no calls, just us. And 
And I think my life has become so much more full. And I, I can't even tell you, I, as soon as I became a mom, I booked so much more work. It's crazy. It's like when you don't have the time, that's when it comes, you know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I, I also, I have a mom guilt trick for anyone. I don't know if it'll work. This is what works for me. If I think that I'm doing like something like, like bad, or I like messed it up. I imagine myself at the same age as the kid where I feel like, oh my God, I was gone for three days. Like I broke them. And then I go to that age and I try to give myself three memories from that age. And if I can't think of it, I let it go. I so it's it. like when you think you're leaving your one-year-old for a couple of days, like they're going to be scarred. Like, remember when you left me for a week? <laughs> Give me three memories from the age of one and then tell me how much you think your kid's going to remember it. That's good. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> That's so true. They're not, they're not always recording memories depending on the age. Uh, but I think also too, I mean, what's interesting too is like you both talked about, you know, the, the challenges of work, of working and, and leaving. But it's also like, I think to your point, Kiana, too, they might remember that as admirable uh, that you were able to sort of, which I, which I do for my own mom, they sort of able to, to do that and raise a kid you know, or, or several, several kids. Um, great, great comments there. I wanted to ask, let's move a little bit in these last um, 30 minutes or so to, to storytelling because both of you are really um, folks that I admire uh, on, on just incredible storytellers. And I think really adept at choosing the types of stories you want to, you want to um, take on. And so I, I guess a two part question building on what we talked about, but a little bit earlier, Bri, I'll start with you. Um, what, what kinds of stories at this point, looking ahead, are you really drawn to telling? And also, what kinds of stories do you think we should see more of um, in, you know, in on our screens in the industry? Uh, the stories that always draw me in are the ones that talk of that really feature the complexity of humanity. And uh, especially when it comes to marginalized communities, I love to learn about like the small cracks that no one really ever sees, but that also like resonates deeply in the hearts of people to be like, thank you for showing that, right? Like, um, yeah, kind of if you're focusing on Iranian stories and you're trying to figure out like, how can I show people like the day-to-day -day humanity of what it means to be from Iran, like, which is something that most people don't know. They only know what is fed to them. And so any story that kind of disrupts the um, the stuff that it's like spoon fed to us about other people's humanity. I love uh, that. I will I will sit and binge it for hours. Um, what was your other question? So it's uh yeah. I mean, I guess two parter is sort of what which you you've answered a little bit about. But what draws what types of stories do you want to tell and draw you to them? But also, what kind of stories do you think we need more of that you yeah. like you know to see more on our screen? Yeah, I think that that's it. It's like, I just want to see more of the crevices of humanity that that's really it for me. I think that there's always like this, um, you know, whoever is in power and control, they get to define through their lens what has value. And I just want to see more of people who actually have the lived experience to have the autonomy to tell their stories and for people to believe that it will resonate and people will see it. And so that's the stuff that I want to tell. And it's always the stuff that I want to see. Uh, I love that. Can I, I'll, I'll throw it to you. What, what kinds of stories do you, are you drawn to, but also what kind of stories do you want to see more of? I, I love that answer, Brie. I think for me, uh, recently I've been thinking about this and I mean, I love a good comedy. I love good escapism, but for me, I want to start telling stories that and see more of this too um art that makes us look at ourselves like really really look at ourselves and be like how are we how are we doing this i'm so disheartened by all of the violence that's going on in the world in the united states and i'm like no we need to i feel like society is a little bit broken and we need to really look at ourselves like how can we treat other people this way how can we do this to ourselves and to other people there's so many stories and to me, I think that's good art is like something that makes you really just take a look in the mirror and be like, no, we need to evolve. We need to do better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that point about self-reflection. I think especially in the US, we could use a lot more yeah. of that. Um, <laughs> uh, Brie, I was going to turn it to you. We had a great question here about, about just being an executive. Um, 
And some of the challenges, and Ken, I know you're you're heading this track too, but some of the challenges of being, you know, being a woman, being a woman of color as an executive, but also being in a space, which I know we talked to you before, of at times a lot of folks feel who are marginalized or underrepresented, that there's not other folks around them who look like them or have their lived experience. And so I wonder, Bree, maybe I'll start with you, if you could just talk to you you know, those challenges, but also opportunities of where hopefully Hollywood's heading for executives like yourself to make, to be in, you know, places of decision-making power. Um, I think that it's hard. I think that it's hard because what I'm seeing, I have a, a group of um, beautiful women, um, Black executives that we get to meet monthly and just talk about, like, what our lived experience is like. And Mostly it's good, but we also recognize that we are the generation where we're like the first ones like creeping up on the C-suite. And then you have like the, the hero stories of people who are already there. And we realize that we're like the umbrella for everyone who's under us. And we feel like everyone's North Star, but we are missing having a plentiful amount of North Stars to go to, to be like, am I doing this right? Am I thinking about this right? Am I okay? And to be like the lone voice in the room. And so I would love to see Hollywood truly invest in middle management so that there could be more people who are VPs and above and pull them up into the ranks so that we can change the way that the C-suite looks. Um, I think that it is, uh, you sit in this really weird position when you make it as an executive, because your currency is often being bartered for what it is that you can speak up about versus what you can't. And so um, from my colleagues, that's what I hear, like the most, like the pain points that exist is how alone we feel um, and how we're just desperate to be seen um, as being additive to the culture and like having value and um, there are lots of places that uh, get it right, but there's still a lot of work to do because I think that there is um, too much weight in people patting themselves on the back that you just exist and yeah. not that you have a pathway to success and that you have value to add to the room. I've certainly seen it done. I've been at a place that has has done it right but um collectively when I talk to my peers who have made it quote unquote um into that executive um range is a lot of isolation and a lot of loneliness and I I hope that when Hollywood thinks about like how to truly understand the fiscal responsibility and the benefits of investing into a diverse amount of people that they truly can see how beneficial it would be to the business and not look at it as a charity lens or like like doing good work that you're actually adding to the value of your company when you invest in the people that you have selected to like pull up to the executive ranks. Yeah, it's this great quote from Brie a few years ago, as you might might have heard it uh, on a previous panel, but where you said, Brie, that diversity is not just a part of your business, it is your business. And that, yes. that goes to your point. Yeah. Yes. Um, Kiana, I wonder if you could build on that because you're also sort of charting a really, um, well, not to, not to overemphasize, but a, a challenging path and also a path that I imagine could feel, might feel already lonely and isolating as a producer with your background, with the stories you want to tell. Do you relate to what Bree just shared? And I wonder how you're navigating those challenges. Yeah, I definitely relate to what Bree just shared. And I think for me, what I've been feeling is like, okay, I really want to feel like people in our industry really care and not just like that I'm a token. I think that's a really, really big struggle that a lot of, um, you know, marginalized groups feel. And and where is that balance? Uh I think there needs to be more conversations about that too. And just how do we treat each other in this new space? Cause I do, I'm so hopeful. I do feel like things are changing. I do feel like, and because of people like us who are taking charge and building our, building our own paths, forging our own ways. But there is also that too, where sometimes I'm just kind of like, okay, are you doing this because you care about our stories or is it just because you feel like it's, 
it's a money maker and this is this is the way it's got to be now so that's that's a big big challenge and a conversation that needs to be ha- to be had yeah absolutely um and i know you're both helping to lead that conversation we have a question here for for you Bri, about if you could elaborate on your relationship as an executive to talent and how you're fostering talent i think this is sort of going to um, a lot of the work that we do, right? We're working with sort of underrepresented talent and trying to give them access and opportunity. And a lot of folks coming to us and saying, how do I get in the door as a creator, as a rising executive, so forth? Yeah, I'll speak about it from the hue side because that's where I really am mm-hmm. uh, identifying talent and trying to get them in the right rooms so that their value can be seen. Um, from my standpoint, I think that more people need to network across and not always up. And I think that from an executive standpoint, I um, always am trying to like facilitate conversations with leaders about doing like bespoke mixers that say, let's meet with people in middle management, okay? Or let's specifically meet with post suits because there is a deficit and a, a huge chasm as it relates to seeing diversity in numbers when it comes to um, post. Um, and so, I like to have the conversation kind of like tick in executives or people in positions of power mind, like what it is that they're seeing and then introduce them to the group of talent so they can see, well, how can their skills be relatable to this? Like, or can I see that the reason why they may not have, you know, some of the premium skill sets that other individuals might have is because they've been excluded from the room. And what am I willing to do in my position of power to kind of backfill their skill set so that they can be um, additive to the conversation to the room and I can bring what they're really good at, but then also give them the skill sets that have been um, neglected by the industry because they haven't been had an opportunity to be in the room. And so um, I know it's hard to get your foot in the door and most of us will put our foot in whatever door cracks open for us. And then you find yourself often like stuck in this thing that you got into, like, oh, only brands in strategic marketing would let me in. So now I'm in this, but I really want to make films. And I just think that um, if you are on the talent side and you're trying to figure out to like how to get in the door, it is not just submitting your resume. It's really networking and doing and aligning yourself with people who are who want to do the work. And I also think that for the first time in our um in our industry, before you would have to have the gatekeepers let you in in order to do the work and start from the bottom. But now you can create with your iPhone. And so I think that you can kind of do what you love and reserve it for the weekends or pockets of time where you're doing um, work. But then again, like using those jobs that are just building the skill set and introducing to other people to build. Um, uh, your like skill currency with also like currency to like pay your rent. <laughs> right. And you kind of, you have to manage both tracks, right? I mean, for those of us who aren't, who didn't, who don't have the, the fortune to, to, to be given a fortune, literally to, to not have to worry about the economic side of it. Right. Yeah. Um, Kiana, I wonder if you could add to that. I mean, just in terms of maybe from the other perspective of being an actor, you know, showing up in the industry, not having, you know, lines of generations of family behind you that have been in the industry in this way, like talk through that. How did you, how have you navigated as talent, you know, trying to build those relationships and create more access for yourself and others around you? I'll say in the beginning I did, when I first moved here, I did so much networking. I went to so many casting director workshops. I tried to meet as many people as I could. And I realized afterwards, like, I'm going to circle back to the class. The most meaningful relationships that I made were people that I met in class. And um, because that can feel really exhausting. You know, you and I go to these networking events sometimes. And when you go to a lot of them, you just can feel really like burnt out. Um, So I think the most important thing is rather than going to so many events, maybe picking one or two that feel the most meaningful to you and focusing on the relationships that you cultivated there. Um, That it's it's hard it can be a really really lonely city (laughs) but it is also really important to meet a lot of people because sometimes that's just how it happens uh something interesting happened to my husband Uh, he 
was in a room pitching a film like 15 years ago and the assistant in the room, the assistant to one of the directors became a producer. She remembered him 15, 15 years later and pitched him for a film that he got and it premiered at Sundance in 2015. So those, those things, you know, those impressions that you make on people, I think it's all about quality, not quantity. Yeah, I love that. And for those who don't know, Keanu's husband is in his own right. Brian is an incredible director, Oscar nominated, and has done a lot of social impact work as well. Um, so that's a, that's a great example of making that right impression uh, even early on when you think no one's watching even. Um, we I invite the audience to ask any questions you have in these last few minutes. I wanted to talk about in this last couple minutes here um, about systemic change. We've been touching on it, obviously, throughout this conversation, but you guys are, you, you know, you're both um, two incredible uh, leaders in this space. And I want to, I want to make sure folks hear your thoughts on, you know, as we think about systemic change in the industry, the industry, I would say 2020, 2021, Brie, when we last had you on the panel, I know it was kind of a fulcrum moment. A lot of people maybe saw it as, of, okay, now there's a lot of talk of DEI and, and, and inclusion, and diversity, but I guess I'll go to you first, Brie, like, first of all, kind of where are we at since then, since the industry maybe started to at least talk more about these issues um, in your view? And also, where do you think we should be going as we think about systemic change towards more inclusion and equity in the rest? I think that we have a lot of work to still do. And I do think that like that, um, I'm going to put it in quotes, the racial reckoning of 2020, when Chris, you know, people Christopher Columbus racism and then thought that they would, you know, create change. I think there were some amazing changes that happen. I also am seeing like the receding of the changes happening. There have been a lot of cuts to DEI budgets. Uh, there have been a lot of people who have lost their roles that um, got them in 2020. And so um, I think that, you know, I joke that I'm like, oh, we're overdue for another racial reckoning so people can remember how important it is to invest in humanity again. Right. Um, I think that, uh, I really want to see every organization who hires humans to create a competency matrix for um, culture values for their company and to hold the people who are in management, in, in management positions to task to ensure that they are accountable for the psychological safety of the folks that they're hiring. Because diversity, diversity hiring means nothing if the people that are there cannot show up as, the, as their whole selves. Um, I really would like to see more of an investment in the um, underdog. And I really would like to see um, just an honesty about like what it takes to truly invest into a community whose, whose voice has been silenced for a long time. There are so many people who have to like, drudge through the muck of like just bureaucratic bullcrap in order to raise their voice and say I'm here and I really want the changes to have accountability measures like it's one thing to provide lip service and to show you know like all those mission statements that came out in 2020 I think right. it's another thing to show you know as an organization how you're putting like your your stake in the ground to say like, this is what DEIA looks like at our company. And here's how we're going to perform. And here are the goals that we're setting for ourselves in the same way that they set other business imperatives, right? And how they create other fiscal responsibilities around their goal, their business goals, that they would do the same thing for DEIA and not let it be the first thing that uh, falls to the wayside as soon as um, the industry uh, retracts from the green lights. Yeah, it's such a good point. I mean, we've seen it, Brie, as you know, I mean, through our own organization of that retrenchment of, of that pulling back of, you know, kind of like we did it, you know, we solved it in 2020, 2021. And, and now we're sort of cutting, we're cutting funding for these programs, we're cutting support for the organizations like yours. Um, and so I think it's just such a great point of more transparency, accountability, and integrating it into the whole business, which I think we're still not really seeing in the full ways that we should. Um, Kiana, do you want to, do you want to build on, on that, um, in terms yeah. of, you know, what systemic changes either you have been seeing on diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, um, but also what would you like to see happen? 
Well, I definitely want to piggyback on what Brie was saying where, you know, I do feel um, afraid that a lot of these initiatives will be reversed. And I'm also seeing something, like I was saying before, there's a lot growing resentment on like token, token. And I, so there needs to be more conversations, people. We need to just talk to each other and have more conversations about this because I, I can feel growing resentment. There have been many, many situations that I've seen now where it's like, oh, well, I'm not a woman, so I didn't get the job. Or, oh, I'm white, so I didn't get the job. Or, oh, I'm this, I'm that, I didn't get the job. And that's that's not fair. That's not what we're asking for. We're just asking for an even playing field to be seen. And I don't, of course, we never want to create more hostility and more resentment. And so there needs to be a little bit of a focus on these conversations and educating ourselves on this topic as well. So we can all work together and go towards this goal of diversity and inclusivity in a healthy way that feels good for other people involved as well and I yeah. that's just my my concern that i've been yeah. seeing a lot of recently it has to be inclusive i don't think that we've got i don't think anywhere gets anyone gets anywhere with shame right like i i'm so annoyed by conversations that are like ah white men am i right it's like please stop like this is not helpful at yeah. all right like you need everyone to to buy in and i think that like the idea that we can try to create meaningful change by like putting people in the corner. With that said, um, I was uh, honored to receive the inaugural action award from Real Screen for DEIA. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I said in my speech was, uh, you worked, like so much of Hollywood has worked so hard to get where they are, right? And they fought to get there. But when, when you when I'm talking about DEIA, I'm there to say the fight was not fair. Yeah. yeah. That's like I just want you to hear me on that. You've earned your way yes. to the C suite. You've you've worked those years, you had those hours that you put in, but there was an entire group of people locked behind a gate that didn't even get a chance to come to the fight. And so the conversations about how to add them to the room, please stop feeling threatened when we try to have that conversation. Like there is a way for you to still hold value and still see the value of others and to use the power that you've acquired in a respectful way that gives it what it, you know, like gives your power what it deserves. And that is to include other people into the space and allow them the autonomy to tell you who they are. And then your job is just to believe them. Yeah, it, it, beautifully said. I mean, just the point about level playing field period and that this has not been equal and is not for, 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 for most folks out there now. We had a beautiful question as well from, um from the audience and we have a couple minutes and we'll wrap here um which is a question from the audience about the audience and really what can the audience members do folks watching you know a lot of us most of us probably have a netflix account hbo max etc what can we do to sort of make a difference on the shows and the content we want to see we've definitely all seen in the last few years um issues on the industry side of lack of marketing shows with underrepresented talent, et cetera. They're not putting the dollars maybe where they should be, but also perhaps the audience can do more to support shows they want to see. So I guess the question to, to both of you, Brie Mail, start with you, what can we do out there in the audience to support this kind of, this kind of uh, storytelling? Watch it. <laughs> Mark, like talk about it on your social media, right? Like get, because you know, like the whole thing about like, the streamers they want to see the watch rate they want to know when you turn it off like you have to let the series run so they're like oh this has value so that they'll invest into it and so I think that the audience needs to just speak up and be, be more vocal about what it is that they want to see and like to look for the diverse content and the the channels that they exist on and to make sure that you're investing your time in watching uh, that content and then speaking about it if it resonated with you. Beautiful side, yeah. Watching it, talking about it, sharing it. How can we? Uh, yeah, you want to echo that, or how? How else can we support the stories? Well, you've seen the power of the Twitter fingers, right? Like these yeah. shows that have been brought back because people are making petitions and doing those sort of things. So I, exactly. I think talking about it, tweeting about it, sharing it with your friends. That that in itself is so so powerful. I mean, social media for this 
for entertainment is huge. I mean, it's it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? But I think if you really want to support people, tweeting, it's that, that simple. <laughs> tweeting tweeting and sharing i love that i'm um, talking about it um i guess last question for you all unless we have another audience question pop up is just you know what is what is your each of you you know what what are your hopes for the future of this initiative we talked a bit about it already but i'm curious you know what what makes you hopeful i guess another way to ask this question about the work that you're doing and the people around you what gives you that sense of optimism that we can you know see the world that we see around us um, maybe even better reflected on screen um brie i'll start with you i think that what gives me hope uh are the people that i see every day in my community i have hope because of leaders like sarah harden and like liz jenkins who um are like sh really strong advocates and not just about like the uh the content but Sarah Harden always talks about like the magic of like being in the room and so when I hear people like her who are in positions of power like having those conversations about um wanting to invest inside spaces that it gives me great hope because that means that people are getting it um I also have hope because I see the story. I, I'm surrounded by beautiful storytellers and directors and DPs and who are passionate about the work. And so, um, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so, and I also, I'm an internal optimist and I just don't, I, I live in the, the headspace of things, of believing things will just get better. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Eternal optimism. We can use more of that. Um, Kiana, last last words to you then. Um, what makes you hopeful? What gives you hope? I think seeing that there is a little bit of a shift going on, that gives me a lot of hope, seeing that there are people who are just as affected as the carnage that's going on in the world as as I am, and they're willing to to talk about it and make stories. That really gives me hope. Even just the um Oscars, the celebration of everything everywhere all at once. I, I thought that was really powerful. I know it's it's an award show, but it it is a big deal. So I'm that sort of thing makes me helpful that Michelle Yeoh is winning an Oscar. Like that to me, I'm like, okay, there's a you know, that this is awesome. This is like a huge step forward in Asian representation and even just ageism in our industry. I, I was so that gave me a lot of help, a lot of hope as a woman of color. Um, but yet yeah, also seeing people being profoundly affected by what's going on in the world and making stories about it. So for all the pain and all the horror and violence that's going on, there are people that are wanting to do things about it. Well, beautifully. <laughs> Yeah, no, amen to that. Beautifully said, both of you. Um, again, our guest today, uh, incredible industry panelists, Kiana Madani uh, and Bree Frank. We're so grateful that both of you joined us today um, and appreciate all the audience input as well. Um, you can check out the, the next segment here in a few moments for those listening live. Um, but again, Kiana, Bree, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. So uh, such a pleasure to meet you, Kiana. I hope we can keep in touch. <laughs> Thanks, Eva.